go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Jim Hoffman. I teach at California State University Fullerton. Uh, for many years, I've taught a class on evolution and creation. Uh, and of course, California State University is a secular university, so I have a wide diversity of students. And so, uh, in many of the sessions we've been talking about, or many of the talks we've heard about, uh, ways in which you interact with students and the degree to which knowledge of evolution versus their religious background impacts the degree to which they accept evolution. What I've been working on for quite a while is our examples taken from molecular biology. And those examples, they're examples of cases where data or phenomena are taken as counterexamples generally to the idea of common descent. Sometimes with respect to neo-Darwinism, but more generally with respect to common descent. And so, in the past, I've worked on an example. It has to do with uh, cytochrome C as a protein molecular clock. This is a molecular clock in which you count the number of amino acid differences between the same in the same protein in two different species, and use that number of differences as a rough gauge of time since descent from a common ancestor. So one example, the example I'm not going to talk about today, is this uh, one I've done in the past, which has to do with uh, so-called or alleged uh, equidistance anomaly. That is, you take uh, many uh, species from a clade, and especially a large clade in which you have a lot of diversity, and you compare a bunch of them to something outside that clade. Like, for instance, you take a bunch of animals and compare them to yeast, and not surprisingly, they're all about equally different from the cytochrome C and yeast because they have the same happy little common ancestor down here. And so the same time has gone by for all of them, no matter how diverse they are with respect to their common ancestor with yeast. So this example is known to some of you. It came up at the Dover trial, the Intelligent Design trial in Dover in 2005. But it's rampant in creationist literature. Um, it's uh, one, one thing I should say before I go any further is that what I, what I like to do in talking about examples like this is not simply introduce students to the latest in modern science. I think it's useful, at least I hope it's useful, to also expose them to some of the history leading up to the present consensus. I found that if someone simply says, well, to understand this, you just have to know something about molecular clocks, go away and come back. Uh, that comes on as very dogmatic and it, it doesn't, uh, it, it gives the Im implication that these answers are simply set and you have to either accept them or not. And so what I try to do is introduce students to some of the history and I've found that generally they're more receptive to a conclusion if they see that it's been approached gradually over time. So in this particular case, you can go back to some of the earliest papers on uh, molecular clocks all the way back to 1963. Uh, uh, Margoliash actually predicted this back in 1963. He wrote it up in a paper and said that all vertebrate cytochrome C should be equally different from the yeast protein. This is borne out by the comparison in table two. He even gave the data showing a bunch of examples, all equally different. So that gets across the point that this is not something that's suddenly been discovered by someone and brought to people's attention, but that it's been around for, what, 50, 55 years? And so it, it's nothing new. So that, that, that's one way to approach that example. Now, the, the one I want to talk about today mainly is a more recent one. This is, was brought up a couple years ago by a creationist named Eugene Gately. I don't know much in particular about him. He hasn't been terribly active lately. But I'm just using him as an example. There are many other examples that you can find. And what happens here is that you compare cytochrome C in an alligator and a human being and you find that there are 13 amino acid differences. But then you compare a primate, Autolemur garnetti, a bush baby, and you find 14 differences. And so he makes quite a thing about this, saying that in the one case you have 87%, but in the primate only 86%. Shouldn't the primate be much, closely, much more closely related to humans than the alligator? And then says, um, this just boggles my mind. How could anyone present cytochrome C as evidence for evolution in light of this evidence? So to the average person, that does seem like a kind of extreme anomaly. Why should the alligator be closer to human cytochrome C than a primate? And so what I've tried to do is look at some of the history of studying these particular species, especially 
uh, cytochrome C because it's such a well-known, it's, it's sort of an iconic protein. It goes all the way back to the earliest days of using molecular clocks. And the first thing to notice, of course, is that bush babies over here among primates are fairly distant related to the humans and apes I mean, among primates. So that means there's quite a considerable amount of time here. And the short answer to when I've asked my friends in the biology department about this, they, oh, yeah, that's not that surprising. I mean, primates have a quicker mutation rate than alligators, and so you know, it's not surprising you get something like this. But to say that isn't, doesn't get at the details of the case. And so what I looked at was, first of all, how do you present this data in kind of a simplified form so that it kind of grabs people's attention rather than show the initial data? But then secondly, look at the history a little bit. And so if you look at those differences, the 14 differences, in many cases, what stands out is that, take a number, uh, say 11 here. Uh, in the case of the human amino acid at that position, it's different, but notice that you have almost uniform difference with the bush baby and all these other species. And of course, you could add to the data by putting a whole lot more. And so in these cases, it, it seems like a reasonable assumption that what you've got in these cases, I should say 11, 12, 15, 46, 50, 58, 83, you've got cases where there's been a substitution in the lineage leading to humans. Where exactly is another question, but it makes sense that that would have happened along that lineage. On the other hand, there are others like 1, 3, 21, 85, and 96, where it makes sense to say that, well, what's happened is a mutation in the lineage that leads to bush baby, because look at all the others, there, that sort of stands out as different there. So if you present the data like this, at least it gives a starting point to say that, well, it's not just arbitrary. You've got a certain number that have taken place in the hominoid lineage and a certain number that have taken place in the uh, streptorian lineage. Now, it turns out there's quite a long history of looking at changes in cytochrome C uh, mutation rates. Uh, Morris Goodman did a lot of this research back in the late 70s and early 80s, and then by 1990 it was summarized in a long discussion of cytochrome C in which the substitution rate here is highest between 40 and 90 million years ago. It's only slightly less between 25 and 40 million years ago, and of course it's exactly the time period that we're talking about when we're talking about the diversification of primates. Uh, what Goodman and his group also did was to correlate changes in cytochrome C substitution rates with other components of the electron transport chain, in other words, the other proteins that interact with cytochrome C to allow uh, phosphorylation, and showed that there are also increases in those rates. Even more specifically, in a paper in 2001, you see the list here, which is exactly the list of changes in the human lineage, the lineage leading to humans. In other words, those uh, changes were already specified and pointed out, so they, it's not like they're after the fact. So you can do the same thing with alligators. I'm not going to talk about alligators. I want to get on to talk about one other type of evidence, which is the pseudogene evidence. But you can also talk about the lineage leading to alligators, which is an extremely slow uh, example of cytochrome C change. So what, I don't know if it's been was done deliberately or not, but that choice of examples was one in which you've got very fast uh, accelerated rates in cytochrome C on the one hand and very slow ones on the other, and so it turns out to be a, a nice example, a nice um, counterexample. Now, one other type of evidence that kind of emphasizes the non-arbitrary assignment of these changes to the two lineages is the pseudogene evidence. It turns out, uh, beginning in the 1980s, 1981 in particular, we started studying uh, pseudogenes in cytochrome C. There are 49 of them known now. They tend to fall into two groups. Uh, group one has almost identical uh, amino acids at the 14 differences that we've been talking about. Those have been concluded to be fairly recent cytochrome uh, pseudogenes, approximately 30 million years old. And as you would expect, they take place 
after those mutations in the lineage leading to humans and apes, and that's why they're basically identical, with a few exceptions, as you would expect from a, you know, a random stochastic, stochastic process. On the other hand, the other 45 pseudogenes uh, are interesting. I've color-coded them. I don't know how well you can see these color codings, but I've color-coded them uh, according to whether they are similar to humans or similar to bush babies. And you find them falling nicely in place, as you would expect. Uh, 11, 12, 15, 46, 50, 58, 83, all took place in the lineage leading to humans. And so you would expect bush babies to like, be identical with them. Uh, on the other hand, the ones that came within the lineage leading to bush babies is where you get differences. So if I just list all the various possibilities, uh, 1, 3, 21, 85, 96 are different from both sets of pseudogenes. Uh, among the, the uh, bush babies, autolemur auto garnetti, and down in the humans, you get the, the opposite correlation. Might be easier to see if you just put them on a chart here. Over here, somewhere would be, not precisely, but somewhere around here would be the changes in those five amino acids. Over here would be the changes along the lineage eventually leading to humans. This class of pseudogenes is really relatively recent. This one is much older. And so these changes show up different from the uh, pseudogenes along this lineage because they're completely independent of them. On the other hand, class one pseudogenes turn out to have the same changes as the uh, in the places where the mutations took place in the human lineage. So, so it gives you a, a, a a more complex set of data to look at. It's not simply a matter of counting how many differences there, are, differences there are in the two examples and saying, well, look, you got more here than you do there, and that's not what you're supposed to have. So I think one way to uh, kind of make the point is to go way back to 1965 when Zuckercandle and Pauling, in one of the first papers on molecular clocks, said that Counting numbers of differences in amino acid sequences is only one stage of the analysis. Recording the nature of the differences is a necessary further step in the establishment of molecular phylogeny. So trying to get that point across, uh, I have a whole semester to talk about these things. <laughs> trying to get it across in five minutes is not easy, but fortunately I have the luxury of a semester and I can take as much time on an example as I want. So my hope is that you combine not just sort of the latest view on a particular issue, but also the history uh, leading up to that conclusion, and then try to have some graphical effects that show the data in a simplified way, the way I did here, that uh, gets the general conclusion, uh, conclusion across in a way that students can understand it.